what to let go. Um, it's a tricky one for somebody who works with art history and whose discipline has been archaeology first and foremost. <laughs> and then, you know, like uh, a magpie, we sort of collect every little thing and store it all up and then try and read meaning and make narratives out of it because the other hat one has learned to wear is that of a curator. And as you try and make narratives out of it, it comes with certain difficulties because you might end up doing grave injustices to the histories that you're trying to present. And so I say with several caveats and cautions that there is a certain inevitability that historical make memory will make for a kind of common ground for all of us. It allows for us to be able to think theoretically in abstract ways about identity formation, which is what history museums are trying to do. The expectations of art history have changed dramatically, which the museum has not always been able to keep pace with for many reasons. I've been interpreting and placing antiquities and traditional art objects within a contemporary cultural frame through my exhibitions and writings. I've had to find ways to share my enthusiasm and reveal how ancient and traditional art can speak to contemporary political imperatives. Now, in order to do this, I've tried each time to be able to speak in the language of the visiting public and worked particularly hard at making sure the exhibitions were easily comprehensible in Hindi when they were shown at the National Museum and in CSMVS, or in French and Dutch in Belgium. The language of discourse and internalizing it and acting upon it, rather than leaving it as just some kind of armchair discourse, is difficult both in selecting and presenting the objects that would do this, but also because this still shocks and it still unsettles our institutions. The yardsticks for history are rather different from the discourses around the contemporary, from the several, and the several instances of this that my exhibition making has dealt with. Um, out of all of those, I'll try and select only a few to be able to share with you today. My latest exhibition that I was co-curator of, as Inti just introduced, was called India and the World, a History in Nine Stories. The exhibition was arranged chronologically. The purpose of the exhibition was to be able to bring a globalizing discourse into Indian art history for an Indian public. So the intention of the exhibition was to be able to stage conversations between 120 odd objects that came from the British Museum to India and 120 odd objects that I had selected from different Indian collections to be in dialogue with each other strategically at different points in these galleries. The galleries were arranged chronologically. And now the minute you do this, they all sounds very simple, so that the Indian public, it seems, such a benign enterprise, would enter the exhibition and see what was happening in the rest of the world while there was the dancing girl of Mohenjo-daro or while there was the Taj Mahal being built in in Agra, what was going on somewhere else, a great epochs of Indian art would allow some kind of a way of understanding what was going on in the rest of the world. We'd imagine that was a fairly straightforward enterprise. But our relationship with chronology, with time, with the living world, and that which lives beyond can be viewed from many different perspectives, actually. This exhibition presented a history of in India and the world in a linear fashion, but different cultures have conceived different notions of time and history, and not always in a linear way. So this last object, which was the finale of the exhibition, um, is clearly about that. It was about the anxiety of losing cultural specificity. It is a work by the contemporary sculptor Ellen Tallur in a work titled Unicode. Unicode, as you all know, is that font which stays stable or the same across diverse computer operating platforms, allowing things to retain their identity in a global language system. Now, looking at this sculpture, we see an enshrined god made of concrete and money, the properties of the new Unicode god of our times. <laughs> 
Tallur's work is framed by the halo of the cosmic Nataraj, an iconic symbol in Indian art which reflects an arrested moment in time. The Nataraj Shiva moves to the rhythmic sound of the drum in his hand, a pulse that measures time as he dances the dance of destruction, leading to death so that there can be rebirth, which are seen as the only real markers of personal time. Now, in Ellen Talur's Unicode, the exploding force of the cosmos within which we imagine Shiva would be dancing appears now to be entombed in a ball of concrete and coins within a traditional prabha or flaming halo that celebrates this new god. Unicode is a language of characters that forms a common global platform able to transcend medium and inevitably absorb symbols from all over the world. Tallur's Unicode, God of Destruction and Time, may be covered in concrete and money, or they may not even be a god inside, or perhaps concrete and money are the new gods of our time. But its referential history and embedded memory are still unmistakably Indian. So we can package it however we want to. And that's quite important, that you can still have a notion of being able to give it an Indian identity in the packaging. Now, importantly, this work was shown in Delhi, but it was censored by the time it reached the National Museum in New Delhi. The exhibition was, threw up major challenges, some of which were anticipated, but several of which emerged one of the problems in a globalizing discourse is that curators tend to put formalist objects together formalistically. And that ends up having the effect of sometimes comparing apples and oranges, because there may not really be a connection between the two things. Now, this had been highlighted fairly early on, and so it was decided that thematics would be equally important as much as chronology. But what is important in one civilization at one date need not be as important in a different civilization at the same time. So then chronology goes for a toss. So either you stick to the theme or you stick to the chronology. And it wasn't always working out. And then we talk about inheritances and we talk about identity formation. And so bookending the beginning and the ending of the exhibition were these two sculptures which was all about the appropriation of art and heritage of one civilization by another for their own ends, which was something that was quite clear that we were doing, which is what history is always trying to do. And so how the British Museum and the Enlightenment had appropriated the Roman sculpture in the first instance, and then how it is now entering a globalizing discourse of a hegemony of certain kinds of art practice was, of course, the message of the second sculpture. Now, how do all of these complex ideas get transmitted to a public that isn't necessarily au fait with these kinds of concerns that we curators may share. And translating it into, into a vocabulary was quite tricky. Now, language is only one of the major carriers of knowledge. If the writing of a curatorial narrative was to happen only from the perspective of those who did not or could not critique the Enlightenment and colonialism, then many other worldviews would have been dismissed as some kind of ethnographic other, their histories made irrelevant, as we just heard in the previous two papers. India and the world was an endeavor to look at world cultures, but from an Indian perspective. So there was as much Indian as there was of the rest of the world in this exhibition. But the impossibility of any single Indian position and the limitations of an Indian language to describe cultures that have not been recorded in Indian history forced us to acknowledge repeatedly that it is not just the West that has ethnologized Indian art, but that Indian institutions and the Indian Academy equally ethnologize those from within India and from other parts of the world. From one perspective, there was nothing ethnographic in this exhibition. Perhaps we can claim this because everything in the exhibition had been given an ethnographic status. Now, having recognized this, we need to tread with care when claiming to speak for the citizens of the world whose histories have been silenced. No project can be all-inclusive. 
But we can still ask, are the same people to be left out each time? Marketing wanted the exhibition to have iconic objects that make it easier for the public to connect through the familiar. But the familiar is often that which has been used in violence acts of silencing other histories. How do we display our post-colonial position then? So I think in the workshop that I conducted with you yesterday, I brought up the trickiness of even finding an Indian translation for the title of this exhibition. So a year before the exhibition opened, I'd suggested several titles, none of which were considered suitable. Till 11 days before the exhibition opened, there was a crisis and there was a meeting and the graphic designer had simply written India and the world in Devnagri, in the Indian script, in the, yeah? And just that, just, it, didn't, it didn't have Indian words. And why was that? Because the first thing was that we couldn't agree on the name for the nation state of India in, in Indian language. <laughs> was it to be called Bharat, which would define the modern state boundary, whereas I was talking about civilizational long durée? Could it be called Hindustan or Sara Jahan? And I was told that was far too much Urdu. <laughs> and so I came up with the title of Des Pardes, which was as much about the other not the foreigner, but the Pardesi can be the outsider from within the national boundary. So a Bihari is a Pardesi in Bombay, a Lahori is a Pardesi in Amritsar, almost. <laughs> and, and so it was in translation that it captured something more that was close to what our intention was than what the English title enabled, perhaps. But by the time the exhibition came to the National Museum in Delhi, the title had been changed by the government to Bharat or Vishva, which has a very different connotation. And it doesn't have any of the lilt that the first title did. So even when we started this ex exhibition project, we knew that a history of the world would show that there are many varied measures of progress in different parts of the world. Given that objects valued by one community do not have the same significance in another, this is as I was saying, we can't always compare two objects together because you might be comparing apples and oranges, actually. Secondly, we were agreed that we needed to think about a global art history. Sure, we need to sensitize the Indian public to an appreciation of the rest of the world. That is much needed. And in the exhibition, we displayed important museum objects to enable strategic conversations that would allow an Indian public to view their history in a global context. The narrative was achieved, that was achieved in the exhibition points clearly to the somewhat benign, I should say, <laughs> interpretation of interconnectedness of world civilizations. Now this business of interconnectedness, um, it almost came across like a bit of propaganda. But this was seen perhaps as a necessity, given the Brexit world in which we live, a world in which countries are shutting their doors to their neighbors, and a post-colonial India so keen to build its nationalist narrative that it resists appreciation of the histories of the rest of the world. So is interconnectedness, after all, passé? How do you make an exhibition that celebrates interconnectedness without taking account of the still fraught colonial history. India asked for Britain to send more of its cultural assets to India in compensation for all that it has taken. And perhaps there were Britons who felt that they must show a willingness to share. It was agreed that the people of both countries needed such an exhibition. However, once the Bonhomme dissipated, more serious questions began to emerge. As I had feared from the start of the project, complicated questions on the terms of sharing were raised. Who would decide how and which history of the world was to be presented to an Indian public? Was it a decision to be taken by the British Museum? Was it going to be taken jointly by representatives of both countries? One would imagine that these are no-brainers, but they are procedurally fraught at every end, Indian and British. Both countries find themselves in politically strained circumstances with the rise of nationalism, and the institutions in both countries find themselves in administrative quagmires that actually prohibit the very enterprise of equitable sharing, which needs must be the very basis for a global art history. An important objection raised in Bangladesh 
Some years back, when the Musée Guimet wanted to borrow the treasures of Bangladesh for an exhibition, is worth remembering. The Bangladeshi press raised a question about France, about whether France would be willing to reciprocate by lending its best treasures, which included the Mona Lisa, for an exhibition to Dhaka. People laughed, and the matter was superciliously derided as a mere provocation. But it rang all too true in the academy, where we've been trying to find terms for exhibiting global art history, and all eyes were peeled to checking if the British Museum would be willing to lend its most significant pieces, or were they only going to pass fairly interesting things as loans because that was regarded as being good enough for India. These were among the many difficult questions to think about, and I cannot claim to have addressed them all adequately, if at all, actually. But what is important, however, is that the questions were raised and will continue to be discussed on many occasions. So I would like, through my talk today, bring in a more positive note. Um, and I'm going to try and bring in my focus on one of the major subtexts of the narrative. This wasn't one of the themes that was explicit in the show, or in my previous show even, but it was a definite part of the narrative, a subtext of the narrative of my exhibitions. How do we bring a history of erotica, gender, and sexuality into a public discourse? These were some of my curatorial concerns. Now, as we just heard, the body in Indian art and thought was held at Boza, and India and the World was held first at the CSMVS in Mumbai and then at the National Museum in Delhi. The main subject of each of these exhibitions was what it stated in the title. And in order to communicate this, each exhibition was divided into eight or nine, eight in the first instance and nine big galleries in the second instance, each of which covered a significant aspect or theme to make up that narrative. However, each gallery also had an extremely important subtext and sometimes even a counter-narrative that was consciously worked into the storyline. This subtext allowed me to explore something that was politically and socially relevant. And this is why we are here today, to talk about how heritage can empower our narrative of identity. Critically important archaeological evidence and artworks lie neglected in museums for want of a more updated interpretive framing, commensurable with the needs of our times and reflecting a more accurate picture of the research that has been done in the past 50 years. So, um, I would like to discuss some problems that have become apparent to the enterprise of bringing that kind of research to the public. Why was it so difficult to do? So the first instance, a lot of artworks were displayed in this very benign, as I said, interpretation. Ceremonials and courtly etiquette were the subject of Gallery 7. Now ceremonials and courtly etiquette based on war and conflict were shown in, a vitrine, were shown in vitrines containing armor, an ankush, an elephant gourd, a dagger, sword, and shield from the different Indian courts of the 17th and 18th centuries. They also showed the normative roles for men and women, how they've been promoted in society. This shield, made of rhinoceros hide, shows a day in the life of the Maharana of Udaipur, divided into eight segments, the eight prahar, or the eight times of a single day. It shows him leaving his palace, practicing archery, hunting. In fact, the majority of scenes show him hunting in different ways, with a spear, a bow and arrow, a gun, from the protection of a machan, camouflaged in a forest, and so on. In one of the scenes, he is shown grabbing a bathing beauty he encounters in the forest and having his way with her, while at another place, he is shown passing by a temple, presumably taking the blessings for all the different ribald and macho activities that are displayed on the rest of the shield. In fact, the last scene shows him coming back home to his palace where his wives have all lined up to receive him. 
Now, normally, as an art historian, one would only write about the marvelous neem kalam style of painting, this shaded gray and gold, this um, single color painting, without focusing on the two narratives that make this object relevant for our time. Two, firstly, the machismo inherent in this narrative, which is questionable from our feminist perspectives today, and the fact that it is an object made out of the hide of a rhinoceros, an animal that once roamed across South Asia but is now extinct in most of that region and can only be found in Assam. Similarly, beside it was a long scroll painting. A painting copied from a famous Ming scroll shows an idealized portrayal of Chinese courtly life. It depicts a spring morning in the Han Palace. Women of the court are shown at their leisure, playing musical instruments, dancing, writing, having portraits made and playing games, activities that behove women. Now, aside from the empress herself, many women occupied the imperial court as courtesans or servants. The concubines are often seen, were sent to the imperial court from surrounding states such as Mongolia and Korea as a form of tribute. Families of other women hoped their relatives would be selected to join the court as a way of elevating their family fortunes. And so you get a story about how normative behavior from the court is spreading into bourgeois families through such practices. In the body in Indian art, we began the exhibition with a series of memorials to the dead, men and women. And this included a series of memorials to sati. Now sati, as you all know, is when women are cremated on their husband's funeral pyres. And it is a very good example of this. Few things have received as much critical study as sati. One had to look harder and deeper at museum collections to be able to come up with a more empowering history. Can we find examples of women who have displayed agency? And so how has that agency been received? If so, how that agency has been received? So you know, these were the establishment of normative tropes. It's only when you establish a point can you start interrogating that point and start displaying a counterpoint, a counter narrative. Um, sati is the practice of voluntary immolation by a woman on her husband's funeral pyre. This practice was widespread in India till it was finally abolished in 1829, legally. Commemorative stones called sati stones are erected in many parts to honor the memory of the women who committed sati. These are carvings of the palm prints or other markers of women who cremated themselves. Now sati has been typically thought of as an example of Rajput patriarchy that was widely prevalent in some part of northern or central or perhaps even eastern India. But sati stones are also there in South India and the one on the right comes from the Chennai Museum which was deliberately chosen to disturb that misnomer and show that the practice was widespread in South India as well. We carried on and we came across two warriors one committing harakiri with a blade at her throat, the other disemboweling himself. Two powerful works that showed the long history of religiously defined martyrdom. These are warriors who had fallen in war. And religious martyrdom is something that goes back as much within the Christian and Hindu traditions as it does within the tradition of Islamic Jihad. But its presentation as only being a part of a history of one religion was something that was needed to be dispelled. But I want to focus not so much on the man is disemboweling himself, although I want you to see that having disemboweled himself, he is going to rise to heaven. And there are two celestial maidens called Apsaras who are waiting for him in heaven with fly whisks. So like the Paris that would be there, the Huris that will be there in heaven, there are these Apsaras who are waiting for him in heaven as well. But as I was saying, it's not the man that is my concern. It is the statue of the female warrior. Women are also commemorated for their valor and fidelity. Now, normally, the fidelity aspect was done for those who committed sati, 
and it is rare to find examples of women warriors. We know, for instance, of Rudramma Devi, the Kakatiya queen who went to battle in Andhra Pradesh. And this is a statue that comes from about the time of her reign. It is satisfying to see an example of a woman commemorated for her valor. At first glance, this piece makes clear that women had agency. Yet if you look at it carefully, it provokes a question about why there are apsaras waiting for her in heaven. Is it that as a woman, she isn't allowed to have men to look after her? After all, this is the same society that was elsewhere making images of sati. There, were no equivalent, there, is, there was no equivalent of apsaras for what would be suitable for women in heaven from a female perspective, from a heterosexual woman's perspective. Of course, many people would argue that she may be a lesbian, and that may be true. However, that argument doesn't hold water because, not because there was no lesbianism, but because the point being made is that there was no commemoration of the latitude and sexual freedom that heterosexual women would have had. I don't wish to be misunderstood as someone who only wants to criticize history. I do think it is remarkable to be able to celebrate a sculpture such as this, which gives women some agency and does at least show that they were warriors rather than just wives and mothers. But at the same time, I think it is important to interrogate that history and not just be congratulatory. So what powerful models are there then for women in Indian history? And we had in the body in Indian art, a work by Sheila Gowda. Now one can go back further to some mythic past to try and find examples there. But in general, this is a dangerous ground to get on because we would then have to prove that the goddesses and mythic figures have all been archetypes that have, been influenced, that have influenced social behavior. Long flowing hair, which is what this sculpture is of, may normally be associated with beauty, but tinged here with red, it has a specific cultural connotation. It refers to Draupadi, the wife of the Pandav brothers, heroes of the Mahabharata epic, who vowed that she would only be avenged when she could wash her hair in the blood of those who had defiled her. Now, her vendetta makes for a rather violent archetype of heroism for women, as compelling as those of the warring men in the epic. But does myth never influence society? Well, mythic archetypes have been invoked clearly for political purposes in India in the lead up to independence. During India's freedom movement, a large number of mass-produced popular prints were circulated in different parts of India, which each personified the country as a goddess. Bountiful and graceful like Lakshmi on the right, um, or as Durga, the warrior goddess on the left, and famously as a sadhvi or ascetic for Rabindranath Tagore. Each artist has tried to rouse the public imagination and patriotism by imagining the motherland through a female archetype. So as a historian, one then has to take one's responsibility of presenting these objects rather seriously and seeing what is it that we can write in our text labels that can provide perhaps a more empowering history. I was quite struck by the very famous example of the so-called dancing girl. Now, when looked at formalistically, this is a girl whose body is bent towards one side. And the hand that is, the arm that is akimbo, balanced just above her knee, resting just above her knee, is actually a socket which has a hole through it. Potentially, then, you could put a stick in it. She, held, she clearly held something in that hand. The minute you put a stick in it, it acts as a counterpoint to the extended elbow on the other side. And it creates a certain balance between the figure, balancing it out immediately. Looking at it again formalistically, I was struck by the fact that all her bangles are on her left arm, and she only has one wristlet and one thing on her elbow on the right. Now, as every woman who wears bangles knows, 
that they come in the way of working, and you tend to shift your bangles from your working arm onto the arm that you're not working with. Could it be that this is a woman who needed to keep her working right arm free? I don't know who she is. She may be a guardian, she may be a warrior, she may be some, any kind of a worker. She is somebody who has a capacity for labor, is all I wanted to say. Yet, she's always been written about in every textbook as a dancing girl. And we don't know why she's been called that. And this falls into a certain trope where Indian female figures are either called apsaras or they are called devis. They're either surasundaris, there for the titillation of men, apsaras, graceful seduct seductresses, or they turn into mother goddesses. And there is no space in between for any of these goddesses and or all these divine figures. And you suddenly realize that this is, of course, the old trope. And so this was as much about the patriarchy inherent in the historiography in her nomenclature as much as it was about a lack of examination of this figure for what it was just communicating by just looking at it formalistically. There have been other interpretations that have been offered for this figure in the press. Most notably, a couple of years ago, she was called Parvati. Once again, from Dancing Girl, she had been portrayed as a goddess. But nobody was willing to accept an interpretation for her as anything else. Okay, so trying to work on this history of bringing eroticism. Now, <clears throat> as I was saying to you, another problem that confronted us as curators. For the Europalia exhibition at Bozar, I was told very clearly that we can't have images that display sex openly in this exhibition. But this was meant to be an exhibition on the body in Indian art. And yet, the government of India did not want images of sex to be shown. So how does one get around it? Well, this is a very famous apsara, one of those surasundaris from the temple of Khajuraho in the Indian Museum in Calcutta. So famous was she, a symbol of female empowerment, that the government of India even made postage stamps of her in the 1970s that circulated widely. Fuzzy postage stamps and a small size didn't allow us to quite appreciate the detail of her body. The only thing that she was congratulated for was the fact that it showed that a woman in ancient India was capable of writing. And it showed female literacy. And so they made postage stamps of her. And that is a good narrative, indeed. She is literate. But the other part of her, her back, is incised with nail marks that have been driven into her flesh by her lover. And on the other side of her back, and just under her shoulder, if you look carefully, there are also nail marks for where she's been grabbed. And she is not the only apsara in Khajuraho that has these nail marks. The more you start looking at all of these apsaras on the walls of Khajuraho, you'll start seeing them all over their bodies. They are mauled by their lovers. It made me think that the eroticism is rife. I wasn't allowed formally to talk about it, but there was no way I could hide it. <laughs> it could be an empowering discourse, but equally one has to be critical of the history. A lot of these classical Indian female figures have always been explained in terms of the Sanskrit literature that was promoted by the poet Kalidasa. Now, the women in Kalidas never speak back to men in Sanskrit. In the Kama Sutra, high caste men are encouraged to be good to women and speak to them in their language, Prakrit, a language that they share with the servants. Sure, at a superficial level, one can say that ancient Indian society was liberated and so committed to eroticism as a part of society that men were encouraged to talk to women about what they liked and in their language, but a deeper reading reveals the deep strains of patriarchy that runs through it. Whenever I show these sculptures in my classes, my students always ask me about erotic sculpture and say that 
Again and again, the whole temple of Khajuraho reveals itself to subscribe to some kind of a heterosexual male perspective on a beautifully erotic world. They ask me, where, sir, is the eye candy for women at Khajuraho? <laughs> and indeed, when curating the body in Indian art, this became a problem because while there are hundreds of semi-divine beautiful women whose sexual allure is part of their iconography, there are few sculptures of men or male deities who fit that criterion, not least that what would qualify, not least as what would qualify as eye candy for girls. I'll give you another example. Just as Surasundaris make us question more, make us ask questions more relevant to our times, similar is the Mallinath statue, which also poses important questions. Who could have decapitated this figure? Most instances of iconoclasm in India are normally ascribed to the so-called Muslim invasions. However, that is mostly in the case of breaking of a nose or damaging something that was held in the hand of a sculpture. The nature of the decapitation in this case seems to be far more aggressive. Equally, the subject of the sculpture is itself highly unusual, and this makes us wonder whether the iconoclasm was some perfunctory show of dominance by an invading army, or is there something particularly disagreeable to someone that we can see here? The figure is completely nude and even the pre not even with the presence of jewelry. And this is most unusual in Indian art, and such total nudity is normally reserved only for Jain Tirthankars. Could it therefore be that this is a sculpture actually of a female Jain Tirthankar? Some Jains believe that women cannot achieve the status of a jinnah. Moksha, or liberation, can only be achieved by men and the greatest merit a woman can accrue in her life will allow her the gift of being reborn as a man so that she can aspire to moksha in that life. Yet early Jain mythology accounts for Mallinath as a woman whose gender was changed in later accounts. The sculpture appears from a 12th century and it is quite interesting to speculate as to whether a Jain community in Unnao, Uttar Pradesh, consciously hark back to some older tradition to give Jain women in their community a greater status. Now this is not to say that women have had no agency. This is a sculpture that comes up at the peak of the Bhakti movement, where it had many female poets in India in the public domain. And there are indeed paintings that show women being taught in their own educational institutions. So in the exhibitions, one tried to move beyond a discourse of just fertility, one had the discourse on fertility, but also one had contemporary artworks that questioned that narrative. I'm running out of time in today's presentation, and I still have, I think, a few slides to run through. Um, so I'm going to abuse my position here and take five minutes extra, please, if I may, <laughs> because otherwise I won't be able to get through them. Um, I'm going to start racing through this just as our artists have been at liberty to seek inspiration from anywhere in the globe, from any time in the history of the world, I also wanted to be able to place contemporary artworks in these exhibitions to be able to show strains of how that tradition has been inherited and adapted, as well as how that tradition has been questioned by the voice of the contemporary. So in the 2013-14 exhibition on the body, we explored archetypes and motivations that have, been, that have driven Indian society's perceptions. And Mrinalini Mukherjee's work, Basanti, was displayed in a gallery devoted to the varying ideas of mother. The display explored more than just formal connections and iconography. It delved into the agency of birth and creation, how artists have developed new iconographies in each age for the elemental and varying aesthetics of prakriti, or nature. This prevented us from falling into the all too easy trap of showing an unchanging history, dramatically like a convolvulus blossom untamed. A natural paradise of earthly forces, Mukherjee's work, Basanti, commanded a gallery filled with mother goddesses. It wasn't a direct imitation of ancient sculpture. It was not motivated by religiosity, nor did it have exactly the same iconography, yet it captured something of an inspiration from the past. <laughs> 
which was canonized and therefore, in those cases at least, made into religious imagery. In another gallery, as I was explaining to you yesterday, we explored questions of maternity, how maternity can be called into question. So we had the story of the birth of Skanda Kartikeya, where we had not paternity, but maternity in doubt. In the case of um, an alternative reading from the Jayantir Thankara stories, we presented how in vitro fertilization has been presented, as it were, with Hari Naigamation transferring the fetus from the womb of a Brahmin woman into the womb of a Kshatriya woman time after time, leaving each Tirthankar's caste indeterminate. So how tradition has fought the caste system through a trope of shifting the, womb, shifting the fetus from womb to womb. The birth of Krishna allowed for a story to, be, to talk about the greatest love story of an adoptive child with his adopted mother. The exhibition happened at a time when Article 377, which criminalized homosexuality in India, was um, still not lifted. And the reason given for homosexuality to be criminalized was because it was allegedly against Indian tradition. Now, I haven't time to show you the film clip, but what we did in the exhibition was show different rituals that actually showed a kind of same-sex environment. The Naga Mandala from Karnataka, for instance, shows men impersonating um, women or em embracing each other, which are actually great symbols of fertility for the community, not a symbol of being against Indian tradition. Um, at another part, we had examples of a different kind of pedagogy, where we showed dancers from the Gotipua tradition of Orissa, where the, men, where the boys are trained to dress up as women and be women for seven to eight hours a day in their practice and in their rehearsals. And then we began to say, well, what does that have as an effect on the kind of, of uh, homosociality that takes place in that, in that environment? All of this was not very easy to push through. Sometimes the works were censored, as in this case, the work by the artist Mithu Sen. I'm not going to be able to go into all the details, but in some cases, we managed to get through. For instance, this unpublished photograph by Dayanita Singh, which shows the actress Rekha dressed up as a man. Um, observing, uh, Dayanita Singh artfully observed the choreographer Saroj Khan as she choreographed the female body in a series called Master G in the early 1990s. And here we see two women, actually. Um, the film was supposed to be a, an Indian impression of Basic Instinct that was never actually released. Um, but it was close to another painting which shows Radha dressed up as Krishna and Krishna dressed up as Radha. And that made it very difficult for anyone to say that cross-dressing was not part of the Indian tradition. In the current exhibition, the work by Amrita Shergill, Two Girls, looked at many of these issues squarely. A confident European protectively touches the noticeably shyer Indian girl. Born in Budapest to a Sikh father and a Jewish Hungarian mother, Shergill's childhood was spent between Europe and India the two worlds, painted at a time when she was moving from Budapest to India and against the background of, Indian fa of the rise of fascism in Europe and nationalism in India, there can be little doubt about the shifting feelings of determination and pensiveness in these two women. Shergill's sketches and paintings around this time dealt with issues around the fallacy of racial superiority, her own mixed identity, and the tussles of poverty and tradition, whether in Europe or in India. Whatever else may or may not be, there can be little doubt, like I said, about the determination in the women. Yet the very confident European woman, if you look at her carefully, has no pupils. Is she relying on the far-sighted Indian to guide her way into the future? I know issues around gender identity and sexuality are of no small importance and deserving of public attention, which is of course something I respect hugely about Shergill's work, which is why it was selected for the exhibition called A Quest for Freedom. As a curator, one's job is to be able to provoke and inspire people to be able to come to their own conclusions, although I may at times be culpable of asking them <laughs> rather leading questions. <laughs> 
And I rest assured that we cannot prevent blogs and lectures, which will no doubt follow from the exhibition. Yet the necessary cautions exercised in the writing of the catalog text will hopefully be adequately suggestive rather than determine people's minds for them. And so similarly, I'll end today with a work, because it was an exhibition between the British Museum and India, a sculptor who was a contemporary of Amrita Shergill's, Claire Sheridan, seen very little in the world, made a fantastic bust portrait of Mahatma Gandhi. Sheridan was Winston Churchill's niece. And you can imagine, well, given that it's a matter of public record how much he hated Gandhi, what kind of conversation it might have made across the family dinner table to be able to have your own niece valorizing Gandhi and celebrating him in a bronze bust like this. So there were a lot of instances to be able to have provocative questions that would be posed to the questions that actually disturbed any singular notion of what was the nature of the colonial enterprise, what was the nature of every family in the colonial environment's rec reactions to be able to complicate the story by putting these provocative labels in each case that posed questions to the public. And I hope that is a strategy that actually ends up doing more good eventually because it gives some credence to the visiting public rather than determining the discourse for them. Thank you. <laughs>